Welcome back from the break. I hope you had an opportunity to pick up a copy of Ali, A Life, and we are honored to have author Jonathan Eig with us here today. Um, Eig's New York Times best-selling story of Muhammad Ali was recognized by the Wall Street Journal as one of the 10 best nonfiction books of 2017. Mr. Eig is a Chicago journalist and author who studied at the Medilk School of uh, Journalism at Northwestern University. He's a former staff writer for the Wall Street Journal, where he remains a contributor. He's also written for the New York Times, The New Yorker, The Washington Post, and Slate.com. He has taught writing at Columbia College, um, uh, Chicago, and he routinely lectures at Northwestern. He has also authored uh, Luckiest Man, The Life and Death of Lou Gehrig, Opening Day, the story of Jackie Robinson's first season, Get Capone, and the birth of the pill. Mr. Eig recently won the uh, Penn ESPN Award for Literary Sports Writing for Ali, A Life, and he's working with Ken Burns in making a documentary on Ali. Um, and joining him uh, is a name that we are all familiar with, and we were, uh, we were watching the engagement between, um, between Don and Joe Macy during the previous session. Um, Baby Joe Macy is a New York State Golden Gloves champion and former undefeated heavyweight boxer. He's a native of Buffalo and was a finalist um, in the 1996 trials. He has one of the longest active undefeated professional boxing records in the world for a heavyweight. He was ranked number one heavyweight cont contender by the World Boxing Council and boasts a 36-0 and record. During his career, Mr. Macy was once considered Buffalo's third professional sports franchise with the Bills and the Sabres, the other two. And uh, we have two clips to introduce this topic further. In fact, you've been very nearly perfect. But because letting you do the work, the work you love, might kill you. Here's CNN's David Mattingly. <laughs> After 29 straight wins and 25 knockouts, the undefeated heavyweight contender called Baby Joe Macy seems to have all it takes to be boxing's next big thing. There's only one problem. They said if you go back into the ring, you could die. Why do you keep going? Well, I'm, I'm in full disagreement. I believe that I'm at the same risk level as every other boxer out there. On June 22nd, the Nevada Athletic Commission decided it was too dangerous for Macy to step back into the ring. He was suspended after injuries he sustained in a fight with heavyweight Vasily Jirov in March of 2004. Do you know how many times you were hit in the head that last round? Do you know? 18. 18. 18. Yeah, that's a lot. Macy still won the fight on points, but MRIs later revealed small areas of bleeding on Macy's brain, called subdural hematomas. According to the Nevada Athletic Commission, subdural hematomas are the leading cause of death in boxers. I want them to know that I'm a, a rational person. I would never do anything foolish. I have a lot to live for. Believe me, I have a lot to live for. I'm doing this for you guys. Thank you very much. Well-spoken and charismatic, it's true that his future out of the ring seems full of opportunity. But as Macy prepares for his round in court, he continues to train for a title bout that may never happen. David Mattingly, CNN, Buffalo, New York. Don't move. Who can stick him? Stick him. Stay off range when he don't want to punch. When he's ready to punch, move in. Stick, 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 stick. That's what you do a man like Joe Frazier. Stick, 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 stick. Back off of him. Just keep boxing. Stop. No way in the world. A man just don't have no footwork to catch me. Even the wheel is waiting. Keep your camera moving because I'm kind of fast. Keep your camera moving. Our light weight's not this fast. Fuck, I'm talking to him. I told you. All of my critics. I told you all that I was the greatest of all time. Son, listen, I told you today I'm still the greatest of all time. I'm young, I'm handsome, I'm fast, I'm pretty, and can't possibly be beat.
just like I came in, beating a big, bad monster who knocks out everybody and no one can whoop him. That's when that little Cassius Clay from Louisville, Kentucky came up and stopped Sonny Liston, the man who annihilated Floyd Patterson twice. He was going to kill me. I'm going to float like a butterfly and sing like a beast. His hands can't hit what his eyes can't see. I'm experienced now. Been chopping trees. I done something new for this fight. I done wrestled with an alligator. That's right. I have wrestled with an alligator. I done tussled with a whale. I done handcuffed lightning, throw thunder in jail. That's bad. Only last week, I murdered a rock, injured a stone, hospitalized a brick. I'm so mean, I make medicine sick. Man, dude. Bad. Fast. Fast. Fast, last night I cut the light off the bedroom, hit the switch, was in the bed before the room was done. You better. Fast. Better. You, George Bowman, all of you chumps are gonna bow when I whoop him. All of you. I know you got it. I know you got it, Dick. But the man's in trouble. I'm gonna show you how good I am. Never again say that I'm gonna be defeated. Never again that make me better than I'm about 50 years old. Then you might get me. I told you, I'm the real champion. I told you, I'm the champion of the world. All of you bow. All of my critics call. All of you suckers who write the rain magazine. Box of little fans. All of you suckers bow because the stage was set. You made him great. You made him a bad Joe Wood. You made him a hard puncher. But I want everybody from this moment on to recognize me as a scholar of boxing. If you want to know any damn thing about boxing, don't go to no boxing network in Las Vegas. Don't go to no gimme the Greek. Come to Muhammad Ali. First of all, let me introduce you, Joe, to the guy. You were here 10 years ago. Right after your last fight, you came down here wonderfully. And we talked about a guy who wanted a piece of you. And then you lost him, and you called him out. You said, where are you? Where are you? And his name was Tim Magnuson. And he wasn't there. He ducked you again. I want to say Tim Magnuson Tim. is right there. <laughs> Maybe Joe Mason, you've been ducking me for years. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta Make it, Don. <laughs> Sign him, Don. <laughs> Sign him. <laughs> Finally, after 10 years, we get together. <laughs> Man, alive. Oh, Thanks, Don, for good. doing this. Thanks for pulling it together. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. He um, ended up being my son-in-law. Yeah, the judge. There we <laughs> go. Yeah. So, Joe, you, you saw that clip, and it is a depressing clip. It's a CNN sort of a setup. You were 26-0 at the time, and you were uh, uh, in the process of going, arguing before the Nevada State Athletic Commission a licensing agency. And for those who uh, look, are, are going to get CLE credits, uh, we're going to talk. The theme throughout this is kind of licensing. That's the legal part of this. We'll get a lot of boxing. But that's the license because you got a license to actually box. So uh, in order to continue your boxing, you had to work through the Nevada Licensing Commission. So we were there. You were 29-0 and 0 at that point. Can you bring us kind of fast forward after that uh, CNN clip, which is sort of... Uh, Set that up? Well, quick. Well, thank you for having me, Greg. And thank you, Don, for those kind words. I haven't seen Don in uh, many years, so uh, thank you. It's good to see him. But going back to that and then seeing that CNN clip, I mean, it seems like a lifetime ago. Um, a, a little, I don't think about it often, but it's a little depressing looking back at that when I put myself in that mindset. I'm so out of it now. Um, not out of it, literally. I'm out of that, uh, the, way I'm, <laughs> the way I think about life, I should say. But... You know, to be right number one in the world and your next fight to be the world title fight. All I wanted in boxing was a world title opportunity. That was my goal. And I might, what, I might have lost. I might have been champion. I might have been undisputed champion. I don't care. I just want that opportunity. And my next fight was that opportunity. So I had worked my whole life, half my life, since age 19, to get that opportunity. And to have that injury at that time, of course, it's bad timing. Um... You know, today I'm an advocate for safety. I think I've learned a lot um, since then and kind of changed my opinions, if you will. But back then, I wanted that fight. 
I didn't want it so badly that whatever doctors told me, I was going to fight. It's just that every doctor that I saw said I was capable of fighting and continuing my career. Um, after that Giroff fight, um, I didn't feel well. I went to a local doctor here, um, and he said, you know, I, I wouldn't, you have a small, a couple of small bleeds. I don't know whether or not you can fight, continue to fight. I wouldn't want that to be fall in my lap. I'm not the expert. You should go see this doctor, this doctor, and this doctor. Well, we went to all three of them. Julian Bales from the movie uh, Concussion, Robert Cantu. There are several others that are in the field of professional sports, whether it's boxing, NFL, to talk about head injuries. And all these doctors examined me. I mean, they examined me and examined me and examined me. I took more scans and blood tests and more exams and tests. And they all said that you're, you're fine to fight. You are at no greater risk than any other boxer. But there was something, the Muhammad Ali Act, coincidentally, that I didn't know anything about or didn't research before my injury, because why would you, that states any boxer that is diagnosed uh, pre or post fight with a brain bleed, not a concussion, they're a little bit different injuries. A brain bleed can never fight again um, and you're kind of blackballed from the sport. So my injury, I didn't know that. But nonetheless, it gets a little more deeper than that for you law students. I came home to my personal physician. They didn't diagnose this ringside. They didn't diagnose this in the state I fought in. They didn't diagnose, this was not the, that ringside doctor and that commission that I fought in Nevada gave me my test after the fight. And here's the craziness of the support, the sport. Gave me the test after the fight and I went home. You're fine. They have no responsibility anymore with my injury or anything that happens to that fight. I got on the plane and went home to my personal doctor a week later. So the injury is diagnosed. Um, whether you look at this as a pro or a con, um, I mean, I should have continued on with my career, but those records were basically leaked to back to the Nevada State Athletic Commission. And I'm watching the Friday night fights at home one day, and Teddy Atlas says, and there's a top heavyweight contender who's got a brain injury. I'm not even sure if we could be talking about this. And I'm sitting there going, I wonder who it is, but it was me. And um, we got the phone call and the letter from the Nevada State Athletic Commission stating that you're, you can no longer fight again. You have a subdural hematoma. Well, we wondered how they knew that. So it does get legal, and it's kind of coincidental we're here because uh, it was a, basically a violation of HIPAA. The imaging center here locally, without saying any names, and, uh, um, sent the report or thought they should send the report back to Nevada. But they didn't have to, and they weren't required to, and didn't need to, and they shouldn't have. Um, so nonetheless, it became a big legal battle, but that is now over. But um, it cost me a lot of money with Mr. Cambria to take several trips to Nevada, where we actually won that um, Nevada State Supreme Court case two years later, basically on a loophole. So it took several hundred thousand dollars for Mr. Cambria, <laughs> to who I, lo I love, Paul, who said, um, listen, you can suspend a fighter two years later who doesn't have a valid license. So he's not suspended here. And the judge agreed. And basically, you can't suspend a fighter who's not licensed. So the judge then said in Nevada State Supreme Court, two years later, two years of my prime boxing ability, well, um, you're free to go. You're free to apply in any state you want, and it'll be that state's discretion whether they choose to license you upon medical testing. So we got up from there and looked at that as a victory, but it really wasn't a victory because Nevada wasn't going to let me come back after a two-year legal battle. I didn't care about Nevada. I cared about one state, and that's New York. That's where we were drawing 18,000 people at the arena. Well, of course, New York and Nevada are basically when it comes to boxing in cahoots. One does what the other does. So New York was out as well. So we thought, well, you know what we'll do is we'll fight in states, lesser known boxing states, to prove that I'm healthy, to prove I'm capable. We'll climb back up the rankings again. We'll get that contract. I had an HBO contract. I'd fought on HBO a handful of times. They dropped me. 
no one wanted to be with a head case, if you will. So we're going to prove ourselves. And we kind of, we did. I think I did prove myself. We had, I think, five fights in lesser known states. I went to Puerto Rico and then Arkansas and Connecticut. I went back to ESPN. I fought on ESPN fights. And I was uh, um, raising my level in competition and getting back into shape. And I was there. And in 2007 was my last fight in October of 2007 in Connecticut. I think it was an ESPN fight. And I knocked out a kid named Shannon Miller, a contender, in about 30 seconds. And we went back to the, whole, the locker room, and my team was celebrating, saying, listen, HBO has got to look at us again. New York State has got to be looking at us now. It's time. We're, we're, we're back. And on the plane, I said to my then girlfriend, who's now my wife, I think I'm done. It doesn't matter what HBO says or what New York says. We never even asked. I just stopped. So I, kinda, I was kind of done with the sport at that point. So that's a long story. But um, that's basically the, the legal battle uh, of the head injury. I'm going to segue now to Jonathan Igu, who uh, has the book, which, gosh, if you read the reviews from The Economist, The Washington Post, The New York Times, obviously Ken Burns has glommed on to the book and him, uh, the, the, the seminal treatise, if you will, seminal tome on, on Ali. But as you were just hearing, Jonathan, a little bit about uh, the Nevada State Athletic Commission, uh, licensing, uh, hits to the head. You saw that so many hits to the head here by uh, the, the commentator was talking to you at the end on CNN. It kind of resonates a little bit towards the, the Ali story at the end. Uh, can, you, can you see a similarity here? Yeah, there's a lot of similarities. And um, one of the things I decided to do for this book um, is to see if I could count how many punches Ali was hit with over the course of his career. And I worked with CompuBox, which does the, keeps the stats. If you're a boxing fan, you watch the fights now on TV, you see that CompuBox will tell you at the end of every round how many punches were thrown, how many landed, how many were power punches, et cetera. So they went back and watched every one of Ali's fights on film. That there were only, I think, six that we couldn't find complete films for. And they counted every punch. And we were able to see that in the second half of his career, he was getting hit a lot more than he was hitting his opponents. I think that the total number, I, I, I may not have this right, I think it was 17,000 punches that he took over the course of his professional career. We extrapolated and, and figured his amateur career, exhibitions, sparring sessions, and came up with a number of around 200,000 punches that he was hit with. Um, and I also worked with speech scientists to measure Ali's speaking rate, because by the end of his career, he was even asking people about his concern that his speech rate was slowing down. And if you watch the clips of Ali, uh, you can hear by the, by the mid, late 70s that he's slurring his words, he's speaking more softly, and he begins to become, become concerned about it. So I actually worked with speech scientists and we, we calculated his rate of speech and found that from 1970 to 1980, he lost 26% of his speaking rate. Now you and I um, would not lose any of our speaking rate at, you know, from age 30 to 40 but he lost 26% of, of, the, of, the, of the rate at which he spoke. So by the time his career is nearing an end, this is a very serious concern, and he keeps retiring and coming back. You know, he says that um, Spinks is gonna be his last fight, then he loses, he has to fight Spinks again, that's gonna be his last fight when he wins, but he keeps coming back. When he decided to come back for, to fight Larry Holmes, uh, his former sparring partner, there was a lot of concern about whether he should be licensed to fight, and that fight was in Nevada. And they sent him, they insisted that he go to the Mayo Clinic for a complete workup. And the neurologist at the Mayo Clinic said he had difficulty standing on one foot and had difficulty successfully touching his finger to his nose repeatedly, but that he was okay to fight. Ali at the same time was, was desperate to lose weight. He was, he was not in good shape. He did not, he, he really, um, he found it more and more difficult to to summon the discipline needed to train for these fights as he got older and perhaps as he was already suffering cognitive decline. So he began taking a lot of pills to get ready for that fight, a lot of diet pills and some thyroid medicine. So as a result of that, he, if, if, as you probably know, he lost that fight. He looked terrible. He, you know, he, um, if you watch the, the, the tape of the Ali Holmes fight, it appeared, and it's, it's, in, it's in Las Vegas in a tent in the parking lot of Caesars, and it's broiling hot, and Ali does not appear to be sweating at any time in that fight. And he said that he just felt like a zombie, and he 
probably just taking too many pills. And a lot of people don't know this. He failed the drug test after the fight. Mm -hmm. And at, as a result of that, he was suspended. The Nevada State Boxing Commission took away his license and said, you can never fight in Nevada again. Ali, in response to that, withdrew his 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 license if I'm if I'm if I'm getting this right um, so that he so that before they could take the license away from him he withdrew his own license so that he could not be suspended and then assuming that he was going to retire thought that, that would be the end of it but he decided to fight one more time and for that fight against Trevor Burbick he he had to go to the Bahamas um, similar to what you were saying you had to go you know you had to look for a place that would allow um, a fight and in this case. Clearly a damaged fighter, clearly a fighter that everyone knew had failed a drug test after his last fight, and still, at, at the age of 40, is, is uh, being licensed to fight in the Bahamas against a, a much younger, stronger man. And uh, you know, he lost yet again, and uh, that finally ended his career. Staying with you, Jonathan, uh, we talked earlier with Don Elbaum about his experiences with a guy named Cassius Clay, and that goes way back to the early 60s. This is what Elbaum and, and Clay uh, interact. Uh, your book chronicles obviously his life and part of that is his dealing with his fame, also his religion, and also with his draft status, and which ultimately found its way to the United States Supreme Court. We have a lot of students who showed up here for this uh, uh, main event uh, to learn a little bit about that aspect of it. In a, Kind of a Reader's Digest format, can it may be easier, or by the book. Uh, we'll do both, do yeah, both. Do both, yeah. Uh, um, Ali um, was never very interested in politics, even though he was a child of the, of the 60s and the 50s, and while, when he was in high school, was, was not much interested in the civil rights movement. But when he began boxing professionally, he discovered the Nation of Islam, and Malcolm X, Elijah Muhammad, and became fascinated by this religion that said that we don't want integration. We don't want what, what Martin Luther King is talking about. You can't trust the white man to ever deliver for us. We're going to go our own way. We're going to do our own thing. And when he won the heavyweight championship over Sonny Liston and announced that he was joining the Nation of Islam, he became hated for this. He said that Christianity is a religion that was forced on my people when, I was a, when we were slaves. The name Cassius Clay, that's a slave name. That's the name the white man's family stuck on me. Slave, slave owning family stuck on my family. I don't have to keep it. I don't have to be a Christian. I don't have to be Cassius Clay. Changes his name to Muhammad Ali. But the, but the white press refuses to accept this. They, they, they continue to call him Cassius Clay. He becomes despised for his religious choice. The Nation of Islam is considered a, is considered a cult. Some people even consider it a terrorist organization at this time. And when he then goes a step further and says that he won't fight in Vietnam, he becomes perhaps the most hated man in America, among whites at least. Um, if you think Colin Kaepernick now is getting a hard time, forget about it. Ali was, was reviled. And he didn't care. He, this was his religion. He believed in it. And he was going to stick to it. When, he, when Vietnam came up, this is where things get a little interesting. Because Ali was never an easy guy to figure out. He never, he never did things the, the obvious way or the simple way. When he, when he found out that he was eligible, first he was not eligible for the draft because his IQ was too low. He failed his IQ test, probably because he was dyslexic. You know Ali was no dummy. But he, um, they changed the, the, uh, the cutoff because they needed more soldiers. So suddenly he was eligible again. And when asked how he felt about being drafted, Ali's first response was, I'm just as dumb as I was last week. <laughs> they said I was too dumb to fight. What's, if I was too dumb to fight last week, why am I smart enough to fight now? And then he said, well, you know, I'm making millions of dollars and the government's taxing it like crazy. I'm, they can take that tax money and they can buy tanks and bomber jets. So if I keep boxing, I can help them win the war. <laughs> Doesn't sound like a pacifist, does it? Um, then he says, well, just send some football players over there, some baseball players. They're just as big and strong as I am, but I don't want to go. Still doesn't sound like a, not, not a very good uh, legal uh, standing here to, to make a case. Then he begins talking about the racism of this, the fact that he's being asked to go fight for a country that treats him like a second-class citizen. I can't even eat in certain restaurants in my own hometown. I'm the, I'm the heavyweight champ, and I get treated like, like dirt. Why should I fight for a country that treats me like that? Why should I go over there and kill these dark-skinned people in Asia? I got no quarrel with the Viet Cong. And only 
then after all of those, after running through all of those arguments, does he say, it's against my religion too. My, my teacher, Elijah Muhammad, says that we only fight in, in wars of Armageddon. We don't fight in secular wars. And that's the argument that he ends up taking to court. And he took it to court and um, with not much success until it kind of got to the Supreme Court. So did you call it, went to the uh, 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 induction board. Uh, they actually had to set aside to a referee uh, to come up with a recommendation. The referee recommended that he should be a conscientious objector, which didn't find its way into the actual court system. Right. Yeah. He was convicted, sentenced to um, five years in prison, $10,000 fine. He was stripped of his bike boxing license again, even though there's nothing in the law. Notice the license keeps coming up, yeah. folks, for legal I'm, credits, I'm guys. There, there's nothing in the law that says a convicted felon cannot box. In fact, you know, you'd probably wipe out half of the heavyweight division if you, <laughs> um, if you did that. <laughs> a third. We got the expert here. One third of the heavyweight division, convicted felons. But... Nevertheless, because Ali is hated, it's really, you, you know, I think it's pretty clearly an act of prejudice. They take away his boxing license before the case, while the case is still working its way through his courts. Ali is still um, filing appeals. He loses appeal after appeal. Um, he does finally get his license back. Uh, first, he's allowed to box in, a, in, a, in Georgia, where there is no state boxing commission. And then the ACLU appeals his case in New York, and he gets his New York state boxing license back even while his case is still working its way through the court. So his conviction has not been overturned, but he gets his New York State boxing license back. That's when he fights Joe Frazier, 71, and loses. Um, and soon after that fight, the Supreme Court reverses the conviction on a technicality. I don't know how much you want to get into that. Um, they didn't want to make any precedent with this case. They didn't want to have to decide whether uh, members of the Nation of Islam were true conscientious objectors or not. They were afraid that it would open the floodgates that every black man in America, maybe a lot of white people too, would, would join the Nation of Islam to um, avoid service. So they intentionally, um, the, the, the justice who um, was really decisive in the case called it a peewee. We want to make this a peewee case, something that will not set any kind of a precedent. So they found a technicality. And they even sort of admitted that it was a, that it was a, it was a PR thing. They, they thought it would look bad to sustain Ali's conviction without giving him a day in court, without letting him be heard, that it would just make it look like they were out to get him. And they wanted to reverse it, or at least, you know, some of the justices wanted to reverse the case, let him off, um, but they didn't want to make any kind of a precedent. An interesting Robert H. Jackson postscript in the Ali world that you probably didn't, weren't aware of, Jonathan, is the fact that the case in conference uh, was five to three to uphold the conviction of the Court of Appeals, which had upheld all the convictions along the way. And it was five to three, and they handed it to uh, Justice John Marshall Harlan. John Marshall Harlan was the successor to Robert H. Jackson ah, upon his death in nice. 1954. Had to bring it in, sports fans. Had to That's bring it good. in. So, and John Marshall Harlan, it's the, the, what happened, I, I got a little, uh, and it's in your book, uh, but the clerk for Harlan thought, man, this, this is going in the wrong direction. So the law clerk for John Marshall Harlan, who had been assigned to write the majority opinion that was going to be voted on in conference five to three, kind of uh, worked, worked his boss. Yes. Worked his boss, and his boss then sent around a note saying, yes, I've just been assigned to write the majority opinion, which was going to affirm the Court of Appeals. The conviction will stand. I'm changing my mind because my law clerk just blew in my ear and suggested otherwise. He didn't say that. But that Tom, Thomas Crotmeyer, Crotmeyer, I believe. Crotmeyer. Crotmeyer, yeah. And so he changed his opinion, and now it became four to four. Now, all you law students and lawyers know that when it's a tie, because Thurgood Marshall had recused himself, uh, it's affirming the Court of Appeals. So that wasn't a good result. So Potter Stewart, uh, who was another judge, decided, all right, let me come up with an idea, and that's where the technicality came, where that uh, administrative referee who had actually done work on the beliefs of Ali and recommended that, in fact, he was a conscientious objector, that piece of evidence never got to the uh, uh, induction appeals board. So that absence of the evidence was something where we couldn't determine 
what his actual beliefs were, hence on a technicality, it then became unanimous. Right. It went from five to three, affirming it. So by one clerk blowing in the air, one judge who was the successor to Robert Jackson, it's a beautiful world. Um, so that's the Supreme Court part of this. You're, uh, you're, are you still a commissioner with the New York State Athletic Commission? <clears throat> I don't think I'm actually any longer uh, 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 commissioner. No, that was a few, right directly after my career, they brought me on as a deputy commissioner. I didn't have a lot of activity with them. Here's why. Most of the fights take place downstate. It's kind of a regional thing. If fights were to take place in Buffalo, Rochester areas, I could be ringside and help out. At that time, I thought it would be a great role for me to actually work for the same commission that wouldn't let me fight, that I fought <laughs> against. But the administration changed for the good, in my opinion, uh, after that. And uh, Melvina Lathan at the time took over, and I loved Melvina. Of course, she would never let me fight. I still love her. Um, but uh, I didn't have a lot of activity because, again, a lot of fights don't take place upstate New York. Most of the fights are down downstate, but I no longer carry that role. Based on, though, I mean, isn't it ironic that you, as I know, you became a commissioner of the same commission that wouldn't let you fight, that essentially uh, accepted the uh, Nevada State Boxing Commission. Uh, did you ever get to a point where you're at a meeting saying, hey, guys, I'm glad to be here, but uh, what did you do to me way back when? <laughs> were, you, were you ever curious about that? Um, well, the, chair, the chairman that left that seat, he, he was not exactly a friend to Team Macy. And as a couple physicians on that medical board, that are still no, not really friends to, to Team Macy. They're, the, the physician, the medical board still sits, and they're, they're the same, uh, I believe they're the same uh, physicians. Um, I mean, it's long said and done now, but it's still the same medical board, and they're the ones that I think are the end all be all. They make the decision whether or not we're gonna license this fighter or not. Now, I gotta say, back to the head injury thing, um, it's it, the, the rule, the law, needs a lot of tightening. It's not, it's my opinion, but it's, it's not an opinion, it's a fact. Every boxer that has boxed at my level has suffered a subdural hematoma. Now it goes, uh, it's not a fact because fighters don't get tested when they exit the ring. They get tested before they go into the ring and only once a year for an MRI. But I had a subdural hematoma in a fight and I was planning a fight with Mike Tyson probably 60 to 90 days later, that eventually didn't take place. So in a lot of ways, I'm thankful for everything that happened and how it happened, because I might have died. If that test went undetected, it wouldn't have, because I had great family around me and we went to the doctor. But that happens a lot in boxing. And rules need to be changed, laws need to be changed, because what's happening right now is not appropriate. These fighters are jumping state to state, they're getting hurt maybe sparring, and they're taking a fight a few days later in another state, and uh, they're suffering a subdural hematoma. It's a very, very common injury in sports and in boxing, and they're going undiagnosed. So they need to change. I know it's a financial thing, getting all these MRIs and all that, but it just needs to be more testing. There need be, needs to be more baseline testing. Um, so, I mean, uh, we could prevent uh, further injuries. So a lot of ways I look back at what happened to me as a blessing. Sure, I was a young kid and wanted things to go on, and I also rested for two years fighting this legal battle, so I also wanted to tell them, look, I'm, I'm talking about rest. I've rested two years. I could go back into the ring. Looking back at it now, I, I have no interest in fighting. I'm glad it worked out the way it did, but um, I know fighters. For example, there was a fighter on Las Vegas Boulevard who was on a motorcycle. He got in an accident, got rushed to the hospital, had a craniotomy. And I'm in the medical field now, and I'll talk about irony in a second. They had a surgery, he recovered, and he boxed again. Professional fighter, had a craniotomy and boxed again, yet I can't ever fight again. Um, so I, today I sell medical equipment, and this is a total coincidence. I'm in the operating room every day of the week selling equipment to neurosurgeons. I sell fixation devices. When they take a flap off and they have to put the flap back on, nine times out of ten the neurosurgeon is treating a subdural hematoma. And that's what I do for a living. And he's saving the life of the person who's in a traumatic accident and relieving the pressure and sucking out the blood and keeping that flap sometimes in the abdomen. And that's what I do for a living. By the way, before I forget, you talked about your family so supportive and Team Macy is uh, Joe's dad. Jack is here and he, mm -hmm. the guy guided his career throughout. And thank you for coming down, Jack. I really appreciate my, it. My father, Jack Macy.
who, who very quickly, my father, Jack Macy, and also uh, Mike Bellani, a huge uh, member of Team Macy back in the day, uh, these two guys were the, were the PR minds. Um, I'm very blessed because, you know, I don't think um, we were selling me so much. I wasn't the greatest fighter in the world, but I was very lucky to be from Western New York and Buffalo because I'm a perfect example of how great this community is. If I had been born in a Miami, in Las Vegas, in uh, Los Angeles, um, I might have been number one in the world, sure. I would not have had the following or the name recognition I had. It was only here in Buffalo that 18,000 fans would repeatedly come see me. A lot of it goes to these two gentlemen here because of their PR means and the way they, the way they think and the way they market. But I would have been the same fighter in any other city. I would not have drawn those crowds. These people here are special. They love their own. They came for one reason. It wasn't boxing. It wasn't me. It's from Tanawanda, New York. That's why they came, and because of these two gentlemen. But um, this is a unique community in that sense. Give me your best Mike Bellani story. <laughs> <laughs> There's a million Mike Bellani stories, but um, Mike Bellani is the kindest, most thoughtful, generous guy. Cares about his community. Um, I mean, he's just a great. Fr I mean, I get emotional, but he's a great friend. And there's. I mean, everyone has a Mike Bellani story, but uh, everyone loves him. He's like uh, P.T. Barnum. He, every room he walks in, everyone knows he's there. But that's Mike, and uh, that's why he's one of the best uh, marketing promoters that, that I know. I've got to digress for one second because I've got to put this in. This is, a, this is a life lesson that Mike Bellani uh, conveyed uh, unwittingly to me, but it's a very good in case you see me actually exercise this particular life lesson. When he's, Mike walks into a room, he's, he's a presence. He's a big guy. And he walks in, and he, everybody gravitates towards him. And when we were starting the Jamestown Jammers, he was directly responsible for the rich uh, entertainment, rich sports, to be the uh, owner of the franchise in Jamestown. It's, it's Mike Bellani. Go on unbelievably. So when he comes down the first year or two, we're walking him around, working him around, because he wants to meet everybody. The Smothers Brothers, we walk on stage, some incredible stuff, like he's best friends with Tom and Dick Smothers. They don't know who the hell he is, but he walks on stage uh, at the Regland A Civic Center with the Smothers Brothers. He just walks on. Uh, but the best, and this is the life lesson, uh, people will gravitate towards him, and they'll be talking, they want questions, they got this, they got that. And Mike, you could tell at some point, just kind of wants to move on. Just wants to move on. So he wonderfully, has a camera in his pocket, and he'll pull it out, and he'll say, everybody get together. Everybody get together. I want to take a picture. And then he'll take a picture. Whether he actually snaps anything is irrelevant. But he takes a picture and says, thank you so much. We'll see you at the ballpark, and moves on, and gets out of that awkward conversation. It's brilliant. I've used it, and I pass it along here. I don't, know if any, I don't know if you get any legal credit for that for the last five minutes, but there you go. It's coincidental they're both here right now. I recently saw a movie called The Greatest Showman, and like, there's, two, there's not two guys that I thought of the most while watching this movie, and it's Mike Bellani and my father. The Greatest Showman is uh, basically the, the true story of P.T. Barnum, and I couldn't help but think of both these guys during it. It's a great movie with a great soundtrack to it, but, uh, and the way that they think, and the way that these two gentlemen market uh, there are a lot of like in that way. And, and you know, P.T. Barnum, I remember he was just trying to get all of these different unusual people, these freaks, to come to his show, and everyone thought he was crazy. And, uh, you know, the African-American trapeze artist said, to, he goes, I can't believe you're going to put me on a trapeze in front of these people. He goes, you know the bad press you're going to get? He goes, I'm counting on it. And I just keep <laughs> thinking about these guys and the way he thought, and that's how these two guys thought. And it's a funny story about Mike going way, way back, he's on the cell phone in a Walgreens, and one of my good friends who didn't know who he was was in this Walgreens. He, got, he must have gotten in the car and called me. Goes, There's a big, big guy talking in Walgreens with a phone to his ear really loud as if he's the only guy in the, in the drugstore saying, on this night, if you're not at this fight, this Baby Macy fight, you're in the wrong place. On this night, this is the only place people are going to be. I don't care if you like boxing or don't like boxing. You have to be there. And uh, I, I always think about that story because that's how these two guys think. And my father's the same way of my fights, he used to always say, we're not selling boxing here. This is not about boxing. We're gonna have music, we're gonna have fire, we're gonna have fireworks, there's gonna be mass, this is, boxing's just secondary. We're, we're, this is gonna be the place you wanna be, it's going to be full-blown entertainment. And that's exactly what those fights were at UB, HSBC Arena, Niagara Falls, our fights were something special. 
They were. Uh, Jonathan, are you, as you're hearing this, you're thinking, oh my God, this is a whole lot of stuff going on in Ali's world and uh, the promoters, and of course he was a show unto himself, himself a promoter. Uh, talk a little bit about Ali, the, the promoter. And Don King always said, money is not everything, it's everything. That, those type of comments, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, Ali was maybe the first real genius for sp of sports marketing. Yeah, even when he was just a kid, I want to get a little um, closer to the mic. Yeah. Even when he was just a kid, he was the first to realize that he should put his own name on his shirts. Um, you know, he would work out in a shirt where he just put magic marker. He'd write Cassius Clay on it and try to make it look like the Coca-Cola logo with the C <laughs> big C. Um, that was him, and and he was a genius for it. You know, the um, Don mentioned the um, the Doug Jones fight. There was a newspaper strike at, at that time in New York, and nobody ha had any idea how they were going to sell tickets to this fight when there was a newspaper strike. Um, but Ali, Cassius Clay at the time, was just a force of nature. He was just out on the streets selling this fight. One of my favorite stories about, about young Cassius Clay, he's 14 years old, he's boxing in, in Louisville, and once a, night, once a week the fights are televised. And if the fights are televised, each fighter would get five bucks. And Ali would go around knocking on doors, telling everybody, hey, I'm going to be on TV Friday night, I'm going to be on TV Friday night. He would wander like far out of his own neighborhood. One day he was in this white neighborhood. He knocks on the door and it's his, he doesn't even know it. He's never been there before. It's his trainer's house. Joe Martin, this white cop, answers the door. He says, what the hell are you doing? He says, oh, I'm going around telling everybody about the fight. He goes, you know you get the same $5 no matter how many people are watching on TV. He says, yeah, but I just want everybody to see me. And that was from a very early age. He just had to have the eyes of the world on him. He would often talk about it. He would say, you know, I could, I could parachute out of this airplane anywhere on earth and, and I could drop down and walk to the nearest house, the nearest hut, nearest little farm and everybody's going to know who I am and they're going to be excited to see me walk through the door. And um, he, he thrilled for that. He, he needed that, that, that constant attention and affection and that made him a genius for marketing. Sometimes he went too far. Sometimes you know, he, would, that's, he was so mean to Joe Frazier and he thought it was just good marketing. He thought by calling Joe Frazier and Uncle Tom that um, it would just attract more people to the fight, that it, people would see how much they hated each other, and that would be good. I never really thought about the fact that it was genuinely hurting Joe's feelings and that Joe's kids were being um, you know, beat up at school because your dad's an Uncle Tom and he's going to lose to Muhammad Ali. Um, one other really funny story I'll tell you is you know, when he was flying to Zaire for the George Foreman fight, um, Ali said, hey, uh, he's talking to his manager, Gene Kilroy. He said, I just thought of something. Um, they're not going to know what Uncle Tom is here. So if I, if I, I can't really call George an Uncle Tom, they're not going to know what that means in Africa, right? And Matt Kilroy said, yeah, that's true. Um, she said, so, so who do they really hate? And, uh, and Kilroy said, the, Bel the Belgians, obviously. Uh, they really hate the Belgians. Belgium you know, enslaved this country, robbed them, chopped off their heads, uh, terrible things. Um, so Ali gets off the plane, first day, he lands in, in Zaire, and He's, of course, doing, I am the greatest of all time. He's standing on the tarmac. There's thousands of people. He says, I'm the greatest of all time. George Foreman is a Belgian. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the next day, Foreman arrives, and he can't understand why they hate him already. He didn't do anything. <laughs> That's funny. Now, he did it himself. Was, was, he, was there somebody behind that was sort of prompting him? I don't remember recall, but was there, you know, or was this just sort of Ali being Ali, the poet? Did, did anybody? I think it was all him. I mean, Bert, uh, Bandini was a great kind of muse for him, and Bandini wrote a lot of his Bandini poems. Bandini Brown. Bandini Brown wrote a lot of his poems and, and fired him up. Um, Don King was, was obviously there, too, and, and, and played sort of the, the, uh, the, the, the vaudeville act, the partner in, in, the, in the vaudeville act at times. But Ali did not need much help. How much did the losing his license and he lost his he lost just like Joe here a couple years of uh, economic access you know during that time period how much do you think that really damaged him well when he came back after it was after three and a half years you could see right away and I don't know if Don would confirm this but um, guys who were in the corner guys like Jose Torres who were watching him fight that first fight against Jerry Quarry said he's not the same man you know he's he better we better he we're going to find out soon whether he can take a punch or not because the first few years of his career he wasn't getting hit much and when he did get hit wasn't getting hit hard because he moved so so fast but when he came back from that three and a half year layoff he was taking a lot more punches and he found out that he had a great chin he 
couldn't, he, he didn't get knocked out, and that saved him, but it also meant that he was going to take a lot of damage, and the, the fight started getting longer and longer. You know, he, he didn't knock out a lot of his opponents, so he ended up having a lot of fights, uh, a lot of long fights. He also found that he liked to fight often to stay in shape and to make money, so he ended up taking a lot of punches over the years as a result of that. A long layoff in sports is obviously damaging to anybody. Sometimes you get bounced back, sometimes you cannot. In other sports, you have a better chance of bouncing back to where you were. I don't is that think just it, age, or what is I it about? I don't think in boxing there's ever been someone who had a year or two or three off. Or let's not say a year, yes. That has had two, three, four years off that ever came back to be the same. I don't know why that is. Maybe in baseball, maybe in football, but n not in boxing. You can't. Um, I was not the same fighter in my comeback. And it, the promoter that Mr. Elbaum is pulled me aside and said, you got one more in you? <laughs> um, I'll be 45 this year, so the answer to that is no. But um, you think you can. <laughs> you think you can, but that's a long time in boxing. You could do it in other sports. It's just a long time in boxing. Yeah, let, let, me, let me phrase the question for everybody. Thank Don you. Elbaum asked, uh, he felt, uh, feels that uh, hockey, football, and, uh, and other related sports are much more dangerous than boxing. Want to react to that? I could agree with that, or as dangerous. Um, that doesn't mean there need to be tightening of the laws and regulations in the sport of boxing to help prevent this. Um, then again, I recently, I think boxing is far more dangerous than the UFC. Um, you know, the UFC, and I'm not pro-UFC, I respect it. To give you a perfect example, uh, it wasn't legal in New York. Of course, New York, the last state for everything, the hardest state to do business. It was not legal in New York. And I'm a supporter of it. Fans like it. I don't follow it. I follow boxing. But I also think uh, people need to understand this. The UFC is more violent than boxing, but violence and safety are two different things. More boxers have died than in the UFC. And I don't believe many fight fighters in the UFC have died. But violence and safety are driven thing. To give you a perfect example, there are more head injuries that happen in the sport of soccer and more deadly head injuries than they do in boxing. That still doesn't change the fact that the boxing rules and laws and regulations need to be tightened to help prevent this further. About you, Joe, it has been quoted in high school that you had a cute smile <laughs> and were one of the most clumsy people. One of your observers said you were probably one of the worst drivers in the world and that you were a fat, pudgy kid and the least athletic of your friends. Who said this? Can <laughs> I, I hold you back? Go on, you can Tim Magnuson! <laughs> Tim Magnuson! <laughs> but you started boxing at age 19. You were out of high school at the time, and uh, I, I don't even know where I got the quote. I didn't make it up. Trust me, I didn't make that up. Uh, but, but but really, what changed? I mean, there was an aha moment in your life where you said, gee, uh, this is something I would like to do. And you started in 19. This wasn't not like Don who was at, you know, age five and six and beating people up. It's so unusual because anyone um, that knew me as a child and uh, could picture would never in a million years as a child say, this kid's going to be a professional boxer. I was a tough kid. My brother was the athlete. My brother was good at everything, very athletic. Almost naturally, I was the younger, pudgier brother who was very tough, not talented. Um, people knew me because my older brother. But I still was a good athlete. I still hung in there. I was really small. I was underdeveloped. I was immature. I matured very, very late in life. Um, <clears throat> but to think that I'd be a boxer and have that kind of capability of violence, I couldn't be a more you know, soft-spoken, for anyone that knows me, kinder, caring individual. Uh, so even me at age 15, 14, I loved football. I loved wrestling. I loved baseball. I loved the sports that people loved. But because my grandfather and my uncle, my dad's brother, boxed, my brother and I were drawn to it. We were fans of it. We were, we, the fights were always on TV at our house. We loved reading their clippings. We loved hearing their stories. Never thought we'd do it. Just were fans of it. And everyone knew that about us. The fights would be at the Macy's. But my brother beat me up in the basement with our 
boxing gloves that we had for years and years until one day my dad said, well, why don't you go to the police athletic league gym and beat each other up there and, and uh, it's free, go. He was a police officer. So we did and it snowballed into something. And here's what box, here what's interesting in boxing. Skill and talent, not, they're not meaningless, but they're not even in the top three characteristics. I fought 36 fights, all of which were stronger, faster, more experienced, and better fighters than me. All of them. Uh, boxing is a game with heart and determination <coughs> becomes way before talent. So I learned something about myself. I didn't really learn it. I kind of knew I had it. And this is something my, my dear brother, who is much more skilled than I am, that lacks. And that's that toughness, uh, willingness to overcome adversity. And if you watch that Giroff fight, uh, where my brain was bleeding and I was very, very injured and I have no recollection of it at all, still one of my best fights to date, in my opinion. But um, nothing was keeping me down. Um, there's just something I've learned about myself that uh, if I could get up, everyone could get knocked out cold in boxing, but if I have the littlest capability of getting up, I'm going to get up. And um, I don't know if that's a good quality or bad quality, but uh, I'm going to give everything I can. And that's something I've learned about myself. You learn a lot about yourself in the ring of a 10, 12, 15 run fight. You learn a lot about your opponent in the ring. Sometimes you hate him, but I'll tell you in round 9, 10, as you're staring him down, you almost learn to love him. <coughs> and gain respect for him. But um, that's one thing about myself. And it's my theory and example of Mike Tyson and one of my, and I love Mike Tyson. He's been very good to me too. And obviously one of the fastest, strongest heavyweights in history, there'll never be another one like him. My theory is, and my favorite fighter of the modern era is Evander Holyfield. And you would think, well, Mike Tyson's gonna kill Holyfield. I said, no, no, it's not the way it's gonna be. Holyfield's a better fighter. Mike Tyson's obviously faster and stronger. There's no one that will ever be that fast and strong as a heavyweight again. But that is meaningless in boxing. What is not meaningless is Evander Holyfield will die in the ring. And, Evander, and Mike Tyson is a flat-out quitter, and he always has been. And I don't mean that in a degrading way. He's had a bad upbringing. He's very, uh, he'll quit. Once he's frustrated, once he's confused, once he's hurt, it's over. He's done. Evander Holyfield, once he's frustrated and confused and he's hurt, he is better. And there's the difference. Um, and that's the kind of quality and trait I think I had. I was dangerous when I was hurt and uh, better. And, and that's how boxing is. You know, you hurt a guy and he gets better and he gets meaner. That's Evander Holyfield versus a Mike Tyson. Heart and determination. Was that a characteristic you saw as you were watching all those films of Ali? You watched just about all of them. In, in doing this analysis, did you see that as well as a characteristic? Well, there's no question about it. I mean, if you look at Ali, especially in the second half of his career, he's, he's often getting beat um, and, and just waiting to find the way that he's going to come back and win this thing. And he, he takes a lot of punishment. Um, there are fights that, you know, he, 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 he probably should have lost, fights he, he maybe did lose on, the, on uh, if you're just counting the punches, but the judges uh, give him uh, because he's just – his determination is off the charts, and he's fighting into, you know, to age 40 when he's clearly got diminished skills and, and finding a way to win. The fight um, is never over with him. With yeah. Ali, the fight was never over. As dangerous and hurt as he might have been, the fight, it's just never over. That's right. He would steal the last few seconds of a round, which would sometimes be enough just to change the judge's impressions. He would steal those late rounds when, 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 he, when he should have been getting more tired. Um, you know, it's, it's almost all of his great fights are are tests of will. You, it's rarely just a, you know, in the early years you'll see nothing but the, the flash and the brilliance. But for the most, for the, the majority of his career, it's determination that's winning for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure.
sound just work himself to sleep. Ugh. And I knew then it, it, the work ethic was there beyond compare. The second thing that happened was uh, when he was when he was uh, uh, playing football, he came out on the field and he said he was he was uh, undersized. <laughs> and I said, the coach I had talked to him later. I said, Look at my son, we got right on him. We got him playing center. He said, He's going to be fine because he hits like a ton. <laughs> and then he went out first plate, Joe Submarine, the guy in front of him, and knocked him on the butt. He looked up and he came with me, knowing I was already new. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was certainly true. Certainly true for Ali too. His older brother, who was a natural, better fighter, better athlete, didn't have something. Young boy, the young brother showed up in the gym, and I chased the older brother. Yeah, it's interesting. You're not, you're not telling anyone anything that they don't know. And I speak at schools and teach this, and people don't know that about Ali. They think, well, everything came natural to him. And you look at him in the ring. Um, they don't know Ali was the hardest working guy. I mean, he was in the gym for hours. He sparred 10, 12 rounds a day. I don't know if that was a good thing or a bad thing, but I mean, he, people think, well, he doesn't even have to train to look like, no, that's not the case. Ali worked so hard and trained so hard. And that was a case for me, and I'm no Ali, but I had to. I had no choice to. This sport did not come natural to me. I knew nothing about boxing. I knew that I had to work hard. And I looked at some of my friends, my closest friends, who are such phenomenal athletes, and you wonder, I mean, I, I mean, they were phenomenal. And how many people in this world should make the NFL? How many people in this world should become an attorney? How many people in this world? And they just don't have what it takes. And it has nothing to do with your brains. And it's, it's every, every, this whole world is work ethic. And I mean, to think that I was number one heavyweight contender in the world, I mean, I was nothing like my closest friends as far as being an athlete. Yeah, if you think about Ali, ask yourself, have you ever seen a picture of him shooting a basketball, throwing a football, catching a baseball. He couldn't do any of those things. He was not a good all-around athlete. He, he couldn't even dance. I mean, it, you saw how beautifully he moved in the ring. Yeah. Put on music, he stands still like a tree. He couldn't dance. <laughs> he, was, he was not a naturally graceful guy anywhere else. And I think it's because he worked so hard yeah. to, be a, to, to learn how to box. Yeah. Let me ask a question. Now, your dad's here. Uh, one of the things in the boxing promoter world, and Don Elbaum talked about it during his session, you know, there were the Bob Arams, the Don Kings, the guys who wanted to come in when the boxer had reached a certain stage of their success and sort of come in and basically buy you out whether you wanted to or not. Did, did you get any of that pressure from uh, the Kings during your time period to, to kind of say, Hey Jack, why don't you let me take Joe to some perceived higher level? Was was that a pressure for you? It was. You know, I had uh, interactions with Bob Arum and Mr. Elbaum at the beginning, and of course, I remember Don King and being at his house as a guest. And um, we spent a couple of days in West Palm Beach. I was a very young pro, and we had just learned that something's happening. And we were just got the taste that something's happening in Western New York. These people. The news media is writing about me. I think we had a few thousand people at ECC College for a fight. We did fight in Niagara Falls, in my, really young in my career, and we had like four or 5,000 people. It's kind of unheard of. Um, something's going on here, and I think my team, my dad, were getting the vision that I think in West, we could travel and train anywhere we want. I travel the world and train. But for the most, we'll fight elsewhere, but for the most part, we want to keep these fights in Buffalo. I'm thinking, well, we'll try it. That's unlikely. Boxing promoters around the world, like Don King's, no, Buffalo's never created a heavyweight contender. You're crazy to think that. So we got invited down to West Palm Beach, and we stayed a couple of days with Don King, and it was just uh, 
very extravagant. I, I, you know, I heard him before I saw him. You know, obviously, and he's, he knew we were coming. And he's going, baby, Joe Macy, the next heavyweight champion, get in here. And I didn't even see him yet. He was in a, <laughs> and he's coming in a hotel, picking me up. And we're, baby, Joe, everything was, he's, that's why he's a, a great marketing guy. Baby, Joe, the next heavyweight meet the, I'm like 10-0 as a pro. I mean, not even, I'm like 4-0. Long story short, uh, he handed us, uh, we're in his office, and he went like this with a contract. And it made noise. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, geez, what the hell is that? A book? And he stapled, I think, a million dollar, half a million dollar check to it, unsigned, and said, just go home and think about that. I mean, my father and my team luckily had big visions for me. Of course, I'm a kid going, when the hell are you going to let's have him endorse it and let's do this? Um, luckily, we didn't, because Don had plans for us. We're going right to Philadelphia. We're going right to Vegas. We're going right to, and we're gonna, and you're gonna become heavyweight champion. We're gonna get a title fight and six more fights. We're like, six more fights. Jesus, I've been fighting four years. I, I mean, relax. And you know, a couple things scared me when my father said we're gonna primary focus is gonna be in Buffalo and Western New York. And Don kept making faces. You're crazy. How you can't do anything in Buffalo. There's nothing in Buffalo but the Bills. That's it. Stay away from Buffalo. You're getting go home, pack your shit. Go right to Vegas, Cleveland, all my camps, Lauderdale. You're crazy. A few years later, after we sold 18,000 seats, Don called us. You, you need my help? <laughs> I said, you need my, should, can I, could anything I could do for you guys? I'm like, no, Don. You said to stay out of Buffalo, but we're the hottest ticket in the sport today. And Joe doesn't even have a world title. He's ranked like seventh. He's not even close. De La Hoya, those guys, sure, they're selling TV. They still sell 10,000 seats. We're selling 18,000 seats here in Western New York, and you said we couldn't do it. So thanks to these guys right here, I mean, um, that was their plan, and it was a great plan. Yeah. Great story. Of course, the last time Don had been in Buffalo, he got sued, and Don Elbaum got all his money. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so so nah, this yeah. does come all the way around, Don. You know? And I forget the name of the law firm that represented you, but it was a good one. <laughs> Uh, promoting Don King. You had your own Don King story. I did. Um, I, tr I had to track him down to get him to talk. It took about three different uh, trips. He kept. First time I called him, he said, "I'm working on on, uh, on world peace. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to solve the Middle East. I'll, I'll call you back when I'm done with that." Uh, <laughs> uh, so I I followed him around. I finally. Um, got in front of him, and I've been thinking a long time about what I was going to ask him, you know, because you got to get his attention. You got to get him to stop doing his shtick. You got to, so I, so I, I, I stuck my, my tape recorder right in his face. I said, Don, you, here's my question. You, you've been taking money off people. You've been trading cash for, for, for contracts, blank, getting people to sign blank contracts. You're dealing with the mafia. You're dealing with the nation of Islam. How come nobody ever killed you? And he really <laughs> liked that question. <laughs> and, um, he went on to tell me the story about the first time he met Ali. He said that um, he said cash is, is, is so important because fighters love cash. You write them a check, they don't know if it's going to be good by the time they get to the bank. These are people who grew up, you know, in poverty. They don't they don't trust a check. So you give them cash, you can win a lot of you know you can win a lot of friends that way. Ali came to my house for the first time, and I, I had cash everywhere. I had you know, was, you know I was in the gambling business. I was running numbers. I had just cash all over the house. So I opened up a drawer. And there's just big bundles of cash. There's wads of cash and rubber bands. There's you know, all kinds of denominations. There's loose bills. I told him, you know those bar games? And he's laughing as he tells this story. This is, he says, you know those bar games where you put the quarter in and the claw goes down and, and, you, and you get one chance to pick up a toy? So I told Ali, this is like the claw game in the bar. You get one chance to go down and you pick up as much cash as you want. You can't turn your hand sideways. You can't turn your hand upside down. You just go down and back up one time. And he's cracking up because if he just looks, he could see there were some big denominations, there were some big roles, but he's so greedy and everybody's greedy. And this is the life, the life lesson here. Greed is so stupid, but you can take advantage of greed. <laughs> so he'd put his hand in here. They might get one time he got $10,000, but he, if he'd been smart, he could have got thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 in one handful. But greed is, greed is good. It's is bad for them. It's good for me. And, uh, and, and he took advantage of that and took advantage of Ali with that cash big time. Um, you know, there was a um, famous case after the Norton, the third Norton fight where um, Ali, um, Don was, was supposed to get a million dollars for the contract, but Ali, he asked Ali to give him an, another million. And Ali said, well, I, I can't. The contract said you get one million. 
And um, so, uh, so King sent um, Jeremiah Shabazz to Ali with a, with a briefcase, $50,000 cash in it. And a notary came along with Jeremiah and for that 50,000, it said that for this $50,000, you will sign a contract saying that Don King gets the extra million that he wanted. And Ali signed it, took the $50,000 and then immediately called his, his banker and said, I think I did a dumb thing. And you know, I asked Don about it and he said, he's a big boy, he made his decision. You know, he didn't feel any remorse, any regret, didn't think he did anything wrong. That's business, by the Don King way. You might love him or you might hate him. Uh, um, he's the most educated uh, man that didn't finish fourth grade. And you go in his house, and one thing I'll never forget, and he's giving us the tour, and he's got a library, and it's a library like you can't imagine. And he says, I don't keep books in here that I haven't read completely. Hmm. He's a very, very well-read man. Um, and you might love him and I hate him, but he's, he's an intelligent man. Well, let me jump in on that. <laughs> when I met him, he was in jail for five years. He's yeah. a brilliant guy. He's very interesting. You went to his house. I mean, you were at Christmas, right? So after I interviewed him, um, I, th I felt like he was actually a social guy, that, he, that he, would he was enjoying the conversation. So I called him the next day, and I said, Don, next time, how about we just go to dinner? No tape recorders, no interviews. Let's just go to dinner sometime, get to know each other a little better. He said, why don't you come to my Christmas party? Um, bring your kids, because it's, it's going to be a big party for kids. It's going to be presents. We're giving away presents for, for all the neighborhood kids. Bring your kids. Um, so he was living in Boca, and it just so happened I was in Florida. I was going to Florida the next week with my family, because my, my in-laws live there. So uh, I took my daughters, at the time they were like 6 and 12, to <coughs> Don King's Christmas party, which is not, a, not maybe a good idea. My wife uh, said, I, I don't want to hear about the details when you get back. Bring your kids, wow. Well, how did the kids react to seeing a mountain of gifts? Well, the funny thing was I said to my daughters, um, there's going to be a lot of presents there, but it's not for us. This is for, for his, it's like some kind of charity thing. So the presents are not for you, okay? So we walk in to this house, and, and everybody's walking in with, like, bottles of Dom Perignon. And I brought a little homemade jam that my mother-in-law had made. <laughs> and and, and we, get in the, we get in the house, and the house is just like what you'd expect, like giant statues of eagles and a, and a Statue of Liberty out by the pool um, with, a, with a torch that lights up. And, and we walk in, and there's presents everywhere. I mean, thousands of presents stacked to the ceiling. And my daughters are like, oh. And I said, no presents. No presents. Don't touch. And Don says, uh, kids, go get some presents. <laughs> I was like, all right, fine. Just go. They were all like, um, they were like teddy bears that said, happy 2013. It was 2014. <laughs> <laughs> they, were, they were all last year's stuff. <laughs> You sit there, and does it strike you here during 2018? You were here 10 years ago. You're now in the medical business. Uh, when you go in and meet with the doctors, uh, and you have to learn kind of a trade that dealt directly with your kind of uh, the end of your career. I mean, this whole medical condition. Do you find that just a bit much? And the people look at you and I say, Joe, really? Uh, I, I don't know. The gentleman Dennis was here. I just did a Dennis quick, Webster. Yeah. yeah, I just did a quick five-minute interview on the radio, and I, th I forgot what his first question was. How he's worded worded it. How? I mean, are, are you happy today? When do you, do you miss it? I'm, if I'm not asked, and this is no exaggeration, four or five times a day, Joe, do you miss it? Hmm. I was pumping gas uh, this morning, six o'clock in the morning. Hey, Joe, you miss it? Hmm. And I don't know how to answer it quickly. There are things I miss. There are people I miss. There are odors. I mean, there are just. I mean. I don't want to say that I miss it, and here's why. It was a part of my life. It made me who I am. It grounded me. It gave, allowed me to travel the world. I met so many great people. And, um, but it's a tricky thing when you're in the sport of boxing. I never want to be looked at as Anthony Quinn and Requiem for a heavyweight. I don't want to be looked at like that because boxing, with boxing, comes, man, I could have been. But if I didn't get hurt, you know what I would have been? Man, that, 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 those judges robbed me. If I had only trained hard, I, would want, I don't want to be that guy. It happened, and it's over. That's the guy I am, because I have a new life now. I've got three children. I work for a billion-dollar company called Abbott. I sell a, a product right now. I sell $5 million in product every year 
in just the Western New York area. I love being in the operating room, and I've got uh, you know a million dreams going on in my head. So, I mean, I got kids to raise. So, um, in a sense, it's over, and I don't have to. You know, it happened the way it happened. So you got to be cautious in in, in boxing because I don't want to be that guy. Man, if this didn't happen, do you know what would happen? I would. Joe, do you miss it? Yeah, I, yeah. There are things I miss, but man, I'm on to bigger and better things right now. Now, having said that, recently I got a little taste. I do always thought that I'd like to promote boxing. I wouldn't be a good coach. I wouldn't even be a good manager. I do like to be ringside. I like to commentate. I think that's my niche. If there are some opportunities there, I've done that in the past. But just recently I got a little opportunity to maybe bring some boxing back to Western New York. Um, I would like to do that, showcase some young talent. Um, does that mean I miss it? I want to fight again. If there's only one more fight, I can't be that guy. And I don't want to be that guy. Because you look at these, uh, the movie Rocky. It's very true. It's accurate. I know it's a fiction movie. These guys walk around the street and they're doing this. And I'm, uh, Listen, that's not my life anymore. Um, so I don't want you got to be careful with the sport of boxing. And I respect it. And I love it more than anything. Uh, it's the best sport in the world. And I, re and I respect it in the sense that it's given me almost everything I have today. But I have to be cautious in how I answer that question. No, I don't. I, I exercise. Um, I work out a few times a week. I'm a personal trainer. I don't do any of the boxing type stuff. Um, my hands hurt a little bit, but actually, my face hurts more than my hands. I don't know why that is. <laughs> but, no. but no, no. So I, I do a little exercise. Did Ali, in his life, have a chance to do what Joe just did to reflect? on his life, his times. Was there a cognitive process? I don't know that I came across in the, in the book where he fought, fought, and all of a sudden everything started slowing down. There was the, maybe the, the Parkinson's diagnosis and all of that. Did, was, did he find himself saying maybe a, a, a whole reflective mode here that Joe was at through? He, he was never a reflective guy. He just kind of operated on instinct all his life and figured He's going to take what comes his way. He was never the kind of person who gave a lot of thought to, tried to express his feelings. He would never talk about why he turned out the way he did. He would never psychoanalyze himself. Um, in fact, it's, it's funny, his third wife, Veronica, became a psychologist. And I said to her, did you ever try to like psychoanalyze him? Could you explain like what made him take? And she just laughed. She said, you could, it, no one could ever do that. It's like, the guy was just a complete puzzle, and he was a puzzle to himself, but he did become reflective in one way late in life. He became much more religious. Um, after joining the Nation of Islam, uh, when Elijah Muhammad died, he transitioned to Orthodox Islam and really began to study the Quran. And the one way in that he became reflective is that he believed, um, and this is kind of a, a simple way of thinking about good and evil, he believed that everybody had an angel that kept track of how many good things and bad things you did in life, and that he called it the tallying angel. And that if you had more good things, even if it was just one more good thing, then you went to heaven. But if you had more bad things, you went to hell. He never said what happened if it was a tie. Um, <laughs> but, um, or one of Don Album's draws. Yeah, one yeah. of the draws, right, a draw. I should use boxing language. Um, but he became obsessed with that late in life and really became determined. He said, I've done a lot of bad things in my life. And he became really determined in his later years to try to make up for that. And... Um, and, and he, you know, he went on all kinds of charity missions. He, he raised a lot of money. He, he never really gave the kind of interviews, even when he, when he worked on his, on his autobiography, he never reflected on, on his regrets um, about, he, he said he felt bad for the way he treated his wives and his children and Malcolm X. That was about as deep as he ever went. Um, but never a very reflective guy. I think he was comfortable in his own skin. That's kind of the nice way to, 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 to think about it. You, in preparation for this book, which is so critically acclaimed, you did over 200 interviews and, and just did an amazing amount of research on that process. The book is out. You've been book touring and uh, to, to rave reviews. A lot of it's on YouTube. You were just on at the uh, 92nd Y? Yeah. I mean, yesterday. That was yesterday, I mean, this yeah. Is, this is high-end, high-cotton stuff, uh, only be, to be exceeded by being here today, of course. Um, but what has been the surprise? I mean, uh, not only reaction, but maybe something new that came out of the, the woodwork. You worked, how long did you work on the book? I worked on the book for about four years. Interviewed 
I interviewed 200 people, but I probably did about 800 interviews because wow. I interviewed some of them all the, you know, over and over. Like, you know, Khalila, his second wife, would sometimes call me 10 times a day. Um, so I can't even count how many interviews I did. Um, I think, you know, since the book has come out, one of the really nice things has been that everybody, everywhere I go, has an Ali story, like the great stories we heard from Don. And, and there's so many stories of these wonderful interactions where, you know, that he got no credit for. He, you know, he was really, did, for a guy who loved attention, he did so many acts of kindness that, that nobody would, will ever hear about. Little things, like just the other day, some, somebody told me that, um, you know, they were at a truck stop and, and um, her sister, this, this woman's sister, had just been mauled by a dog. And like a week or two before, her face was all bandaged and, and she was afraid, to, she didn't want to get out of the car. Um, but she had to go to the bathroom. She got out of the car at this truck stop and, and they saw Ali. And of course, there were 20 people around him signing autographs. And he sees this little girl with her face all bandaged up. And he just like walks away, pushes everybody aside and goes over to this little girl with her face bandaged and, and says, Oh my God, who are you? You're the prettiest girl I've ever seen. And just, so he would do stuff like that everywhere he went all the time. Um, and so being on the road and, and, and talking about the book has been really nice for me to, to see just how much he mattered to people in ways that had nothing to do with boxing. Did your pants cross with Ali? No, no it's probably my, one of my biggest regrets. I don't know, I might have had a few opportunities, but uh, I never crossed paths. I've met some great, you know, the, the Mike Tysons of the world and the Sugar Ray Leonards who promoted me, but I never crossed paths. And it made me even more sad when I learned of his death that I never got to meet him. Um, Angelo Dundee trained me for a while in Hollywood, Florida. And the, the months I spent there, I know Ali was, he'd pop in every now and then, but I was just never around. But if you want to watch something cool, I remember watching his uh, funeral presentation on national TV. And if you have seven minutes, YouTube Billy Crystal's yeah. eulogy. It's one of the best, not only is he funny, and they were very close. It's one of the best seven minute eulogies you'll ever see in a couple of stories he shares about Ali, I mean, you'll get emotional watching it, but little things like Billy Crest in the late 70s, and they were becoming friends, he, he called him little brother, hey little brother, and uh, and he said, we're there in West Palm or something about to, and, and Ali said in the morning, I'd like you to run with me, and Billy Crest said, geez, I, I run with the world champion, I can't believe, yeah, wake me up, I'll run with you. He goes, well, I go, he goes where do you run? He goes, well, I run at this country club down the street, it's beautiful, I've been doing it for years. And Billy Crystal says something, you know, champ, I, I can't, I'm Jewish, I can't go there. They, they don't allow Jews. He says, they don't allow, and he's so confused. He, says, he doesn't understand think that way. He says, they don't allow Jews. And he says, you know, he never ran there again. You know, um, and, I, you know, Billy Crystal gets emotional just saying, that's just one of ten stories. He, says, he just never went there again. Um, just the type of person that he was and the way he thought and how innocently ignorant almost he was but how amazingly brilliant he was. So if you had to interview him, what would you, what's a big question you would ask about baby Joe? <laughs> uh, well, we were talking outside earlier, and um, you know, I was asking about um, some of the things we've already talked about, how it felt to, um, to go out a winner, to win your last fight, that's some, and, and to, for, to have your last fight be one of your best. I think that's something that not, not a lot of fighters can say, and you said, that it was, a feel, it was mixed emotions, that uh, it was your last fight, but it was also the, you know... It was, was you know, involved. a lot of people tell me, you know, to, man, there should be a rematch, or but I said, you know, that was really my best performance, that last fight in Las Vegas um, against Vasily Jirov, and those of you who don't know, he's not a household name, but he won a gold medal, a gold medal in the 1996 Olympics. He won the best boxer award in that Olympics. He was something else, that fighter. He is that type of fighter that I tried to explain earlier. Is he a devastating puncher? Is he the most amazing talent? Is he a Muhammad Ali in the ring? No. He's a fighter that doesn't quit. You know, the year before, he, HBO presented him with the Fight of the Year Award against James Tony, and it was one hell of a fight. I remember watching that, not knowing that in a few months I'd be fighting one of them. Um, and yeah, in the last round, I went down four, five, six times. But the first nine rounds, I watched, and I'm thinking, man, we're, I, I, I really, I truly beat an elite, former, undisputed cruiserweight, <laughs> cruiserweight champion. So I kind of went out, in my opinion, on, on a high note. Um, but we're also talking about, you know, fighting in Madison Square Garden, which I had uh, a chance to do. I did do that on HBO. I fought it 
uh, Mandalay Bay and I fought all over the world and I fought overseas. But to fight here in Western New York, it's so much harder. I mean, it's great and a blessing that I had this opportunity and have all these people, but it's uh, to, people's goals, fighters' goals are to get to MGM, to get to Mandalay Bay, to get to Madison Square Garden. That's your goal. You want to be on that stage. My goal was to be downtown here in Western New York and Buffalo. That was my goal. I am so blessed. I'm so unique in the sense I didn't need those venues. I had what I had right here, and that's what HBO, and that's what the Tony Holdens, the Sugar Ray Leonard's, and the promoters that I dealt with uh, knew. Um, and so it's, it's, it's kind of unique in that sense. It was very um, special. Was it pretty heady, though, Ed? You're pretty young at the time, and they used the term Bill Sabres Macy <laughs> in a franchise. I mean, you're just a one person, but you're in that same breath. Did you, that, that, uh, how'd, you, how'd you live with that? That says a lot about the community. I mean, it really does. Um, you know, look at if our bills stink and they're you know, two and fourteen, we, we're selling games out. I mean, the Buffalo people are truly—it's one of the towns that are still people are born here, raised here, stay here. This isn't like a Las Vegas or these other big cities. Phoenix people do move there; they're not born and integrated. These people are from here, care about each other. You know, if someone gets hurt and there's a fundraiser or a cop gets hurt and they have a fundraiser, those lines out the convention center. People support their own here and they want their own to do good. And it, I mean, if I was playing badminton or boxing, it didn't matter. 18,000 people were coming at that level. I mean, they were coming to see and support a Tonawanda kid. Um, so I've been demoted. I'm like the 11th franchise now <laughs> behind. <laughs> I don't know if there's Bisons and a well, we couple little league team. teams. But no, but listen, the people... People are, well, I'm not sure where the Sabres are either. <laughs> I don't know. But the people are still so uh, just uh, great to me. And uh, I recently was bestowed the, uh, an honor later this year. I'll be inducted into the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame. Great. And next weekend, thank you. <laughs> next weekend, I'm going to New York to accept another great honor, the New York State Boxing Hall of Fame. I and mean, this great. So I've been inducted in the Buffalo Boxing Hall of Fame, now the New York State Boxing Hall of Fame. And, and those are great honors, but it's, it's in my field. It's in my sport. So to be recognized in the greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame against, you know, you know the, of course, the Jim Kellys and all the great athletes and Ernie McAdoo's and these, these guys that did such great things uh, to be mentioned uh, along with those guys is great. But I think I was more known for my community work than even what I was known for in the ring, you know? Uh, there was a short while there through the brilliance of, of these two gentlemen here, you know, we're selling something here. And it's, it's not boxing, we're selling something here. And I remember being a young, ignorant kid, and they said, you gotta go to the children's hospital, you gotta go to this event, this is where the cameras are gonna be. And, um, man, I was 18, well, that's crazy, that's foolish, but like, we'll do it. And I gotta tell you, I matured quickly because I started to love doing that stuff. And I started to love my community, seeing the support that they were giving me. And I started to love going to schools. And I, I go to the Children's Hospital every Christmas, and I loved, I love it. And um, it turns out, spiritually speaking, boxing was just the tool. Boxing was just the tool. God gave me this gift to give back, and uh, I think it was just what he put in front of me, the tool. And uh, I'm supposed to give back to my community in certain ways. And you have done it in so many ways. Jonathan, your next book is on Martin Luther King. That's right. And Muhammad Ali was, uh, did, did he think he was a civil rights involved guy? Or is he pretty much kind of into himself? And, and, and also, he met King a couple of occasions. Could you talk to him? Yeah. Um, Ali really wanted to fight for his race, but he did not believe in the civil rights movement. He thought integration was a waste of time. He said that uh, he'd be horrified if one of his children married a white man or woman. And in fact, uh, a couple of them did, uh, and he got over it. But he was not at all interested in the civil rights movement. He, he met King a couple times. King actually mocked Ali and said he was a fool for um, joining the Nation of Islam and that he should stick to boxing because he didn't know what he was talking about. So, but like with everyone else, Ali won him over. Ali made friends with him. And um, they, they bonded, actually, over their opposition to Vietnam. And, and um, Ali met with King very shortly before King gave his most important speech um, when he came out most strongly against the Vietnam War, his Riverside Church speech. Ali met with him just before that speech. And I think um, 
you know, King himself faced a difficult decision on Vietnam because people inside the civil rights movement were discouraging him from taking a strong stand. They felt like it would diminish the energies of the civil rights movement. You know, we're fighting for, to, to end segregation here and you're going to dilute our strength and dilute the core of our volunteer work if you start talking about Vietnam. But, but King refused to, um, to listen to that. He was in, like, in many ways like Ali. A lot of people pushed Ali to, um, to modify his views on Vietnam or at least to make a deal with the Defense Department. The Pentagon offered him a deal. You know, you could box some exhibitions for the military and you don't have to go to Vietnam and we'll let you keep your boxing um, career. Uh, Ali refused to compromise and similarly King refused to compromise and, um, and, and came out very strongly against the Vietnam War and, and it did hurt his standing in the civil rights movement. Believe it or not, we think of King as being the, the, you know, the um, of being the saint, but when he died, he was actually um, declining in popularity, and even um, had a lot of enemies within the, the establishment of the civil rights movement. He was too conservative for the Black Panthers and the Black Power movement. He was too um, left-wing for some of the old guard in the NAACP, and he was kind of um, struggling with that at the time of his death. Did you find that Ali, uh, during that time, pretty you know, kind of this 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 uh, draft dodger, conscientious objector, most uh, kind of hated man in the United States during the '60s, and I, I can recall all that going on, and yet here he is during his boxing career, is uh, uh, becomes the most uh, iconic person probably in the world. What a transition. Yeah. I mean, did you, can you make sense of all that? Yeah. It, it, it's, it, I could, it, I, it takes a long time to explain it in the book, but I'll try to explain it briefly. I think, first of all, times changed. We found out that he was right about the Vietnam War. It was a disaster. And we see that he was truly sincere in his beliefs, that he, he, he gave up the, the core of his career, gave up the best years of his talent, gave up millions of dollars because he was genuine in his religious beliefs. And then he comes back as a boxer, and this is really important. He gets knocked down by Joe Frazier in that fight and gets back up and shows that heart. And even if you hated him for his stance on, on his religion or his politics, you've got to admire that toughness, and that's something that all Americans can, can, can appreciate. And, and that's, I think, that moment, I really believe that that 15th round knockdown, when he bounces back up, that's the moment that Ali makes the switch, makes the transition. You start to see America turning its view of him. And then over the course of the 70s, as he fights and earns his way back towards a shot at the championship, taking on one opponent after another with diminishing skills, we appreciate that toughness more. And he's so lovable, he's, you know, he's playful, he stops talking about a lot of these radical things that he talked about in the 60s. So we just start to embrace him. And you know, there's a, the writer Stanley Crouch has this great line. He says, Ali in the 60s was a grizzly bear, dangerous, rip your head off. In the 70s, he's like a circus bear. He's still dangerous, but he's, but he's fun to watch. And you can, get, you can maybe get a little closer to him. And by the 80s and 90s, when he's sick, he's like a teddy bear. And we just want to hug him. And America, after he lights that Olympic torch in 96, we all just want to hug him again. And all is forgiven. That's true. true but it's so true about in metaphor the, there's nothing more true and more wonderful about boxing <clears throat> than the most obvious metaphors it gives you it prevents you for life and the obstacles life prevents pre presents all of us and everyone but that's what makes boxing great that's why every I don't know a bad boxing movie that I've ever mm -hmm. seen yeah because every boxer's stories are so wonderful uh, they all come from nothing and they have so many things to overcome and the Mickey Ward story and boxing and movies go hand in hand because they're just, it's overcoming setbacks and obstacles and that's just the great thing about it. It's so important to everybody's, everybody has obstacles presented with them in boxing. You're never really tested as a good fighter. The Dante Wilder, is he good? No one knows, he hasn't been knocked down yet. No one knows, he hasn't been in trouble. That's when you're shown to be good. <laughs> true, true. So is he good? Every fighter at that level is good. What does that mean? I mean, every fighter at the top 10 is good. They're in the top 10. Is he good? Did he get hurt yet and win? Did he, was he tested yet? 
Did he take a knee and get up from that knee? That, then you know you're good. Most boxing is regulated by New York State, or by state commissions. There's not a lot of federal oversight. There's been a lot of threats to that, the Muhammad Ali Act, there's some things, but is that the best way it should play out? I mean, we've seen that in both of your careers with the Nevada State Commission, the New York State Athletic Commission, and then you were permitted to, they were permitted to fight in other places, Puerto Rico, Bahamas. Uh, do you get a sense of that in a global sense? Is this a federal issue or does it remain a statewide control? Issue? Real quickly, you could probably speak more intelligently. Keep in mind, boxing is the only sport that doesn't have a governing assault, like the NBA and the NHL. They've got these organizations that oversee all these rules. And most promoters and commissions probably like it that way, that boxing isn't that way because they can alter and change rules as they go here. Um, but I don't know why it doesn't have an organization much like those sports that uh, seem to run much more smoother than boxing. But those are more collegiate sports, keep in mind, and boxing is anything but a collegiate sport. Uh, um, so, I mean, you go through and you, you get hand drifted from college and you're educated guys going into the NHL or NFL. Uh, that doesn't happen in boxing either. But um, there's no organization one sole organization to run boxing. You know, Seth, I, no, I, I think Joe's right. The, the lack of organization has hurt the sport and makes it harder for the fans to know what's going on, harder to know what the rules are, harder to know who's the champion right now. And, and, and I think the lack of federal oversight is just part of that. But I don't really know how one affects the other. Yeah, who is making the rules? The reason uh, boxing was so great in the 70s and even 80s and certainly before then, but now who's saying that there should be a new weight class every two and a half pounds? Hmm. Who's saying that there are five title belt holders? I mean, they're, they're, they're ruining it. Um, who, who is judging these fights? Why are there so many lopsided decisions? I've seen five fights in the last year that the guy that lost won. I, I don't know well, what's going on. Um, and there needs much more oversight. So when the book is written about baby Joe Macy, What's going to be that concluding paragraph that's the <laughs> legacy moment about you? What, what, what do you think they'll say about you? What would they say about me? <laughs> they, or what would you want them to say if they quote know. you? You know, basically the theme in my life is they talked about a book at one point, and maybe one day it will be in a movie. And would it be interesting? Of course, because mm -hmm. every boxer is. Every boxer has a story. Not like Ali. There's no story like Ali, and there never will be. But there are all interesting stories. But, and I think the theme to this uh, script that was already written, actually, uh, basically ended with the idea and theme that, you know, not only does everything happen for a reason, but life doesn't always work out as planned. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes it works out better. And I think that in my case, it didn't work out as planned at all. For many years, we dreamt and dreamt and dreamt about one wish, and here I am 10 years later, 12, 13 years later, life worked out better, better than I could ever imagine. That's great. You have two more minutes, Jonathan, and as people are gonna grab your book, Ali by Jonathan Ig, you know, the, the, the ultimate story on him, what is it you would want the reader to walk away with? What's that it's the greatest with? book of all time. <laughs> 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 um, now, this is a life that, that changed our life and changed our country. And, you know, Dick Gregory, when I interviewed him, said to me, your book's going to be a waste of time if you, can't help, if you can't make me understand why this kid thought he could do this. Because for a black kid growing up when he did, to think he could get away with what he got away with is crazy. So you got to be able to explain why this little kid thought he could be special and how he pulled it off. And, and that's what I set out to do. I think I, I, I pulled it off. I think you'll understand Ali as, as well as, as he can be explained. And it's interesting. The question you asked to Joe is the question I asked Ali. I got to meet him just about four months before he died. And I said he was, he was hunched over a table. I couldn't tell if he heard me. I, I whispered in his ear. I said, I'm writing this book about you, and I'm trying my hardest to, to, to give you the book you deserve. And I just want to know if there's anything you want to say. What's the last paragraph in your book? Same question that you asked Joe. I said to Ali. And he didn't answer me. 
and, and, and he, he didn't speak at all the whole night that I was there. Um, but Lonnie, you know, his wife told me that he definitely heard me, understood me, and he wanted me to come back and read him the book when it was done because more than anything, he loved hearing about himself. And um, I didn't get a chance to read it to him, but I, I feel like I did the best I could yeah, to honor him. He'd be proud. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Joe Macy, Jonathan Ike. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Thank you all.